Hello, humans. And welcome to the Reason and Science Eventually podcast. Hello, everyone. So welcome to my podcast. And this is Federico Pistono. And I am uh, speaking to you in a very different fashion than what, I, what I'm used to. This is going to be an experiment, something that I wanted to do for a long time, but I never got, I never got my head around uh, on the format or what is it going to be, what's the theme. And I realized, you know what, I'm just going to do it. There is no theme, there is no format. It's just me sharing with you some thoughts, some of the things that I'm doing and some of the articles that I find particularly some of the great articles that um, many times go unnoticed because we, we don't have time. We live in this frenetic world where we're always running around and doing things and we, we never have time to... If, if an article is longer than a page or a um, few hundred words, then we think, okay, I'm not, I'm not really going to read it. I... I, I share it on my Facebook, on my Twitter feed, but then I never know if you guys are actually reading through. And uh, because it's it's hard to find the time in in this in this world, we're very very attached to what's in the moment, and we never have time to stop, or we never seem to have the time to stop. So the reason for this podcast is that I know many people commute either by car. Or because they take a bus or a, or a metro to work or um, somewhere else. And so I, I found this habit of uh, having something in my ears that is compelling and interesting um, more than just, you know, filling it up with whatever. It could be music or it could be... Um, sometimes I like music, but... Well, most of the times I like music, but sometimes I want to bring something more with me. And so I've been listening to, to various podcasts and I found this quite useful. So I was thinking, what if I... Um, I was actually inspired uh, by, obviously, other podcasters. And this will be like a live vlogging uh, for me. A podcast live vlogging plus some ramblings. Uh, um, because, frankly, I get too many emails for me to actually reply. So um, this would be a chance for me to actually respond to some of these emails in a format that is more convenient for me because uh, it's one too many, even though it could be addressed as if I was talking to a, um, to a person, which is the way that I, that I think and I interact with the world, thinking that I'm talking to someone. And this is, this is the way I think about this podcast. I'm talking to someone in front of me and... Um, yeah, so he, here is what we're going to do um, with an article that was published in March 30th, 2011 by Roger Ebert. And I'm sure most of you know who Roger Ebert was. Uh, he was one of the greatest, possibly the greatest film critic of all time. Um, even though we had our differences with, with some of the movies that he thought were great movies uh, or vice versa. I thought some movies deserved to be in the great movie list and Roger Ebert did, didn't. Uh, most of the times I find myself uh, not so much to agree with what he said, but to, to actually empathize with, uh, with, with the way he was expressing his feelings and uh, his analysis. And Roger Ebert also had a very interesting blog. Um, he passed away, unfortunately, I think last year. Uh, he had various cancers on his throat. Uh, he had various surgeries that went on. There is a TED Talk that you should uh, check out uh, um, on how the internet gave him back a voice and technology gave his voice back to him in a way. Uh, it's really quite moving. Uh, and he's also very fun and wit. And so it never goes into the dramatic, melodramatic way. But... Um, he keeps his spirit up. A very inspiring talk. I'll, I'll put a link in the description of the podcast. But what I wanted to share with you is this 
article in particular that he had on his blog. He has a very he had a very interesting blog that I used to follow all the time. And this article uh, from March 30th, 2011 is called A Quintessence of Dust. None of this immensity is affected by what I think about it. It doesn't depend on being thought about. If it is true that our galaxy alone might contain 30 to 80 million Earth-like planets, and if every one of them were occupied by sentient beings, it doesn't depend on what they're thinking either. It all simply exists. This is why the process of evolution is so compelling to me. On this planet, and probably countless more, inanimate atoms became molecules, which formed cells, and over billions of years those cells evolved into complex organisms, which finally became viruses, plants, animals, salamanders, banana trees, and human beings. Without giving it any thought, with no way to think, the universe brought into existence a way of making itself seen. There is more than one way to see. A leaf turns to the light. A chimpanzee selects a piece of fruit. A fish sees a smaller fish. An eagle sees a rabbit. A dolphin rescues a sailor. A dog welcomes us home. While all of these actions are guided by a process, falling under the general heading of intelligence, humans seem to be fairly unique in our ability for conscious thought. We see, we know, and we know, we know. This is a blessing and it carries a price. To know you live is to know you die. Having studied several cats at close range over a period of years, I've concluded that they don't give it a moment's notice. They know they want to live, which is why they get out of trouble as fast as they can. Then they take a nap. I read articles about astronomy and physics. It doesn't matter to me how much I understand. Their buried message is always the same. Somewhere out there, or somewhere deep inside, there are mysteries of which we perceive only vague shadows. And there are possibly more mysteries within those shadows, continuing indefinitely. Dark matter was a secret to us. Now we know it exists. Does it have its own secrets? We speak of quantum particles. They are below atoms. Do they contain levels beneath? When we get to the quantum particle, have we reached the bottom or only the deepest point to which we can penetrate? The further we peer into space, the further we are peering into the past. Although I have no realistic grasp of the distance represented in a light year, I understand what the words indicate. Still, less do I comprehend a billion light years, but I understand that Hubble is looking further and further back into the immensity of time. I'm going downtown to see a movie today. I understand that the screening is distant from me in space and time. I know why we see lightning before we hear thunder. I understand why a foreign correspondent for CNN pauses before answering a question. The question must reach and the answer must return. I have some idea of how many miles away a planet Mars may be. I understand its reflected light reaches us after a delay of some minutes. But when we see light from a star that has journeyed for a million light years, all I really understand is that a star is forever out of the reach of my species. What we are left with are cosmic shadows on the wall of Plato's cave. Ultimately, the images from Hubble will give us a glimpse of conditions that existed an infinitesimal instant after the Big Bang. There will never be an image of the Big Bang itself because it had no image. There was nothing. And then there was something. And all we can hope to see is that something as soon as possible after it became. If the matter in the universe has organized itself into you and me and Stephen Hawking, I can think of no reason why 
the same organizational principles wouldn't apply everywhere. In the night sky, we look at the suns of a multitude of planets that might harbor forms of intelligence and look back at our sun. Astronomers search for Earth-like planets because they know life is possible on a planet like ours. They start with what they know. Every day, we read speculations about new forms of life. I don't know why it chooses me to learn that the buried sea on Europa, a moon of Jupiter, could harbor f a form of life, but it does. It isn't necessary for me to understand much more about science than what I read in magazines like uh, New Scientist, Scientific American, Discover, or in the daily newspaper. It isn't necessary for me to understand about movies either, but that's the direction life has taken me. Socrates told us, the unexamined life is not worth living. I think it's calling for curiosity more than knowledge. If every human society at all times and all levels, the curious are the leading edge. But what good does it do to me to think of a universe as an unthinking mechanism vast beyond comprehension? It gives me the consolation of believing I conceive it as it really is. It makes me thankful that I can conceive it at all. I could have been a pair of rugged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. In this connection, I find the theory of evolution a great consolation. It helps me understand how life came about and how I came to be. It reveals a logical principle I believe applies everywhere in the universe and at all levels. Of all the things that exist, animate and inanimate, some will be more successful than others at continuing to exist. Of those, some will evolve into greater complexity. This isn't progress, it's simply the way things work. On this dot of space, and in this instant of time, the human mind is a great success story, and I am fortunate to possess one. No, even that's not true, because a goldfish isn't unfortunate to lack one. It's just that knowing what I know, I would rather be a human than a goldfish. Some reject the theory of evolution because it offers no consolation in the face of death. They must just as well blame it for explaining why minds can conceive of death. Living things must die. That I can plainly see. That we are aware of our inevitable death is the price we must pay for be being aware at all. On the whole, I think we're getting a good deal. When I die, what happens? Nothing much. Every atom of my body will continue to exist. The sum of the universe will be the same. The universe will not know or care. But think it another way. Take a moment to study this illustration. The graphic was created by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to represent 1,235 planets we know to exist and the suns they orbit. Each planet is a black dot. Our sun is below the top row at the right. It's estimated that millions of such planets exist in our galaxy alone. On some of those dots or smaller ones we haven't seen yet, it's possible that evolution has produced minds capable of self-awareness. Those minds belong to beings who think, and ergo know they exist. Some of them wonder why they exist. Some of them look into the night sky and ask the same questions we ask. On every planet where a sufficient degree of intelligence has developed, the theory of evolution must eventually be discovered. It helps those beings understand how they are. It doesn't explain why they are. There is no reason the universe needed to evolve intelligent beings, but it has. It might have been inevitable because of the fact of natural selection. My curiosity leads me to science. My admiration for logic leads me to the theory of evolution. My pride rejects simplistic fables to describe the facts I observe. Where do I find my consolations? There are many ways to be consoled. Everyone deserves to find their own way and find such peace as they can. 
I find my greatest consolations come from art. An artist can express my feelings in the same way as an intelligent signal received from one of those 1,235 dots. Such a signal might translate as, yes, I exist, and I want to shout to you across space and time that we are not alone. A message from light years away would probably miss me in my box of space and time, but I find that art can shout to me across a few years or, or centuries, and it carries the same message, yes, I exist, and you are not alone. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties, in form and moving. How express and admirable in action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet, to me, what is the quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. That's what we are, a quintessence of dust, that Shakespeare could so conclude and then end with the little joke is, to me, a great comfort. So this was A Quintessence of Dust by Roger Ebert on the Chicago blog uh, Sun-Times and um, Chicago Sun-Times blog. Um, I particularly like this piece because, as you can see, um, Roger Eber is not a scientist and actually some of the parts are not exactly accurate when he refers to science, but he does understand the principles and he's fascinated by science by understanding what's underneath the surface. And I, I, I find this, this part in particular so compelling. There are many ways to be consoled. Everyone deserves to find their own way. And I find my greatest consolations come from art. And so, yes, and his message um, lives after death. In fact, he now is dead, but his message lives on and continues because people find it inspiring and interesting and compelling and that it resonates with their feelings, with who they are, with the way they look at the world. And yes, it does say, yes, I exist and you are not alone. And though Roger may be gone now, he lives on and his words live on through his blog post and through my words now and through you who is listening. And I think we can, we can find great consolation in all of that, thinking that if we do something worth remembering, we will be part of history. We will be essentially part of the universe. And quite literally, because if, let's say, this podcast is being broadcast somewhere through radio signals, it is being transmitted into space, into further blackness of deep space. And maybe some intelligence will one day pick it up and um, listen to it. They might, not, they might not understand our frequencies or certainly not understand English, or, or maybe they would. They will because they have some sort of babblefish, uh, Adams uh, <laughs> kind of style. But yeah, this is what I wanted to share with you uh, tonight. Now some news. I, I am in New York City right now. So, so lots of you ask me, what am I doing? Where am I going? And how can I afford all of those, all of these trips and so on and so forth? So um, I've been working a lot on my my startup, Explory. If you want to know a little bit about that, I, I will not give you an introduction now. You go to esplori.net, E-S-P-L-O-R-I.net, Explory. Explory means to seek out knowledge. Well, that deserves a whole podcast on its own. But I'm in New York now. I'm working on this project. Um, 
I just came back from Doha in Qatar, and maybe I'll, I'll do a podcast on that as well, but uh, it was a very intense experience, emotionally intense, so uh, I don't know when I will be doing that kind of podcast, but uh, it might come in the future. After that, I went to Singularity University and I gave a lecture on the future of work and the future of society and the future of education. And uh, more than a lecture, it was it was a discussion, it was a conversation with the class of 2013, the graduate study program uh, 2013 class. And there were also some of the friends, uh, some of my friends came along, Piero Scaruffi, who's an author, a neuroscientist, well, not someone who studies intelligence, thought, uh, how life comes about, and well, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, music. He's a very eclectic person. Uh, you should check him out, Piero Scaruffi. Anyway, he's a friend of mine. He came, he uh, participated in discussion together with the rest of the students and some people from the staff. And it was very, very, very compelling for me because I, I gave a very short lecture. It was about 30 minutes, kind of like my TED Talk. Uh, in Vienna, and then it was open for discussion. So the ratio was 30 minutes and 90 minutes of discussion, which is the way I like it, because I think whatever comes from others uh, so is, is more interesting than what you think you know. My goal is to really kind of just not provide so many answers, although I do uh, attempt to uh, provide answers in my in my way, um, from my vision, but what I re what, what my real purpose is is to raise the right questions and make you think and make you question the way you live and the way you conventionally think about the world, because I think that's the only way to improve and grow. So, with this thought, I leave you to next time. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, this podcast so it actually it has it has a format it has a format I ramble for a few minutes at the beginning and then I read an article comment on it and yeah so I guess it did come out with a format after all so thank you very much for listening and for tuning in this podcast is released under a creative commons license so you're happy and to take it remix it do whatever you want with it as long as you don't make money out of it, which includes putting it on a website that has Google ads or things of that sort. Uh, but you are more than welcome to take it, chop it off, do it whatever you want, put it on YouTube videos and do all sorts of crazy things that the wonderful internet is able is capable of doing. And if you want to be featured in the podcast or if you think there is an article that I should be looking at, I have a really long list on my pocket, so I'm not in shortage of articles that let that be known. But if you think that I should be reading something because it particularly resonates with you and you think it also would resonate with me, then send me an article at podcast at federicopistono.org or just you know, send me a message on uh, Facebook, on my Facebook page or on my Twitter. It's Federico Pistono everywhere. And I will have a look at it and I will tell you if I, if I like it, it might make it into one of my podcasts. And if you have some really good music and you, if you are a musician, you have some good music and you obviously own the rights and you want that to be featured in the podcast, send me those pieces, those tunes, and I will be happy to have a look at them or actually have a listen. I heard you say have a listen. Anyway to listen to them, and if I like them, they will be featured at the beginning of the podcast. So, yeah, because, you know, sharing is caring. It's all about sharing. I will upload this podcast uh, to YouTube, so it will be available on video format as well. Uh, it will not be exactly as a video. It's like the same audio plus a just a screenshot on the back, uh, some sort of backdrop, or... Maybe a couple of images flowing, I have yet to decide, but it will be available basically everywhere. I'm using, um, I'm trying with the Internet Archive uh, to host the podcast. There will be an RSS feed that you can subscribe to, and of course, on iTunes, so you can sync it with your devices and whatever. But it will be available also on my YouTube channel, and you're more than welcome to help 
transcribe and translate the video into many different languages. Now, since, of course, this will be connected to my .sub account where you can transcribe and translate, uh, since I'm reading an article, uh, I will also link, obviously, the original article in the description of the podcast uh, so that you can spare the drudgery of trying to understand everything that I'm saying while I'm reading the article because the text is already there. So you can just take it and um, copy paste it and make it time, ca- time coded and create the captions. So you will find all of the description and the instructions on how to do it on the video podcast or the audio podcast description. You're more than welcome to help spread the word in different languages. Oh yes, I will be at Burning Man. So I don't know if I will have time for another podcast before August 27, but um, I will be first at Singularity University uh, for the Alumni Weekend, uh, the NASA Ames Research Park in uh, Silicon Valley, California. So um, that's where I will be August 20 to 25th or 6th, I guess. And then it's Burning Man time. So um, you could get a hold of me at NASA in three weeks' time uh, on August 20th, or you can find me at Burning Man. I'll see you at the playa. Yeah.